All right, welcome to our first for our first session. Um, today's speaker is John Stewart. John is managing director of Claremont Creek Ventures. Uh, John is also an industry fellow with our center, with the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. He's an expert at the at building businesses that lie in the intersection between life sciences and information technology. Um, He's been an entrepreneur himself, uh, being part of a company called CyberGold from the very beginning through its uh, IPO, through its initial public offering. Uh, he's on the board of three new ventures currently, uh, Arxis, uh, Property Bridge, and Tibby on Bionic Technology. And he's going to tell you a bit more also about um, Claremont Creek as, he's, as he starts to uh, give his presentation. Uh, with that, John Stewart. Thank you, Eklak. I appreciate it. <laughs> Not necessary, thank you. Hey, Iklak forgot the most important thing. I also am a Cal alumnus the, and live a couple of blocks from here. The, uh, so I'm delighted to be here. The, uh, I'm going to give a quick one sentence on who we are. The, uh, we, Claremont Creek Ventures, are a relatively new venture capital firm. Uh, our role in the world is defined promising, high growth, think Google, think YouTube, uh, technology-based companies and to give them the first institutional money so that they can grow their businesses. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit of, of a story of one of those companies because it highlights a, uh, the, an area that you may face in uh, your work here as a student or your work later as you go into your careers of me and my team have invented something. Is it valuable? Can I commercialize it some way? Uh, can I too build something that is big and important and makes me the uh, very happy when I go home at night. The, uh, we've got $130 million of mostly other people's money to invest. The, uh, so we have lots of friends, I think. The, uh, my partners are experts in the networking and mobility applications, in security. Uh, Randy, who's the guy who's follicle challenged, the, uh, he was one, one of the guys who uh, built the biggest biometric company in the world, a company called identics and the, the thing that we like people to remember about us is that everybody in my shop, um, they're, they're eight of us all together, six investment professionals, the, we've all been entrepreneurs ourselves at one point and we think we know a little bit about uh, how to build a company better and faster and that's the expertise we bring to the table. The, the uh, company that I want to talk about is a company called Arxis Biotechnologies. They're located in Pleasanton, which is the, out near Livermore. The, uh, the founders are a UC, Ber uh, UC Davis um, engineer and a UC da Davis scientist. And they were buddies in school, got a job at Sandia National Labs, not the one in New Mexico, but the branch that's right next to uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And they started working on stuff together. And so the question you ought to ask yourself right now is, how did two guys who'd never done a company before, had no connection to the anybody and no rich uncle, how did they get two and a quarter million bucks from Claremont Creek and how, do, how are they now shipping commercial product and building things and have what we hope are great prospects? That, that's, the, that's the story. And the, another way to say that, who's to blame? And the answer is Osama bin Laden. The, uh, when they were at the that Sandia, the 9-11 uh, happened and all of a sudden the, a bunch of people in the world got really interested in how do we protect our water supply and how do we protect the, uh, from someone dropping anthrax or some other uh, bioterror agent over one of our cities, over San Francisco. So contracts started pouring into Sandia and one of them was a water contract and the company, it was an Australian company, said help us build a better box to test the water supply because then we can get big government contracts. The, and the requirements for this system was the, pretty tough. We want to know in 10 minutes or less from taking a sample whether there's the, uh, the one molecule or 100 cells of this bad thing. And we want the system to be able to go any place in the world and be able to sit the, uh, in a culvert or in a stream or in a reservoir and we want it to last for at least five years and we don't 
we want to have to send our, the samples that we collect back to a lab, we want the unit to right there do the work. And in a second I'm going to show you why that work is particularly difficult. And I want this thing to be really sensitive. Don't, the, the, uh, uh, don't ring unless we've really got something. And the worst thing you can do is ring a lot if there's nothing bad in the water. Because if we shut off the water to Berkeley for a day while we're trying to figure out if something bad in it, a lot of people will get mad if it's a false alarm. Now, traditionally, the way this is done is you, you collect your sample and then you have to get your nucleic acids out of the sample. So you have to break open the cell. And after you break open the cell, you have to isolate and purify the, your nucleic acids, your DNA, your RNA, your messenger RNA, uh, your total RNA, whatever, whatever you're looking for. And you have to concentrate it. That's usually through some sort of a PCR step. And then you have to hybridize it and label it. And then you have to have something which detects it. And that whole process takes a bunch of reagents and it takes somebody um, usually with a master or PhD skill watching over the process. And it can take anywhere from two to six hours depending on what you're doing. And that just flunked the 10 minute rule. And it takes a bunch of expensive machines that are finicky. And that breaks the rule that we had of the requirements back here of it's got to be field rugged. And it doesn't need any of these elaborate steps here. And it can't be done in a central lab. So what did our guys do? They invented this. So this is the, uh, a microfluidic microarray system. The, uh, and it meets the requirements that we just talked about. And there's a box that went around it of other things. But this is the, c the central piece. The, uh, and how did they come to do that? The, the answer is that many great inventions actually come out of a phenomena where somebody had to do this two to four hours of work, and it's a real big pain in the butt. And they try to think of a workaround that's easier. How can I automate this thing? How can I make it easier? And uh, I like to think of that as the power of the lazy engineer. And, and they invented a, a series of technologies to be able to accommodate that. The, uh, if you go back to the, the uh, step here of extract, isolate, purify, concentrate, they said, well, you know, maybe we can do that in a box. We can automate all of that. And we can have that the, if we cook the sample to the right temperature under press, pressure, and then we the, the, uh, change the temperature rapidly from hot to cold, and we automate some things, maybe we can do that. And they invented a material inside that that could trap this isolate and purify and concentrate step as effectively as traditional bench methods. The, and it turned out that that was pretty cool because four steps that took a long time now went a lot faster. And that question of isolating something, they said the standard probe set, so what you stick inside that monolith material, weren't good enough. So they went to work on that and they invented a slightly better way, which then turned into a very better, better way of, tra of trapping the nucleic acid in question. The, uh, and it turns out that it's two to 300 percent better, even though the measurement time has gone from four hours to five minutes or less. The, uh, and finally, they put all of that into a lysis box, which allows you to break open the, the cells in question and then use this technology of isolation and trapping with what they now call tentacle probes to do that. And so the, the founder said, well, th this is really cool. And the water company said, thank you, and walked away. And the, the founder said, boy, I, I wonder if we have something that's more valuable here. The, uh, the, this is the way to look at that, that the very first question of, is it more valuable? And I take no credit for this. This is my partner, Randy, Randy Hawks, would say, you got to, John, you got to figure out whether what you've got is a vitamin, aspirin, or heroin. Because if it's only, if it's only a vitamin or it's only a mild palliative, it's not really going to be in, in, interesting. The, uh, so question one, the, uh, how big is the problem that you're solving? The, uh, and how big is the market for that? And how, many, and how big is the need? So 9-11, the, uh, 
created this huge need for this type of, type of, type of solution. And the guy said, boy, we're on to something. So what do you do next? The, um, if you, you're in the position where you and your team have invented something and you think it's cool, the very next step is to investigate this question of how big is it, how unique is it, what are the competing solutions, how important is the question, and how sticky is the solution. And sticky is that sense of the uh, once I try your solution, I don't want to go back to the old ways. I don't want to do anything else. Example, the, uh, was it um, CMPC, which is Sutter Hospital in the city, uh, looking at a company which has the, the, uh, figured out a new way to schedule capital equipment inside hospitals. The, uh, and they've got their first customer up, and they're, they're very proud of that. And I went over and talked to the lab tech. And uh, the, the, uh, I said, uh, Leonard, you know, tell me about how this works. And he showed me how it works. And I said, the, uh, you know, how long did it take you to learn how to do this? And he said, oh, well, it, 10 minutes. It's really easy. The, I said, well, that, 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 how much time is it saving you a day? Oh, he says, saves me the half an hour in the, in, in, at the beginning of the day every day. And it saves me another 15 or 20 minutes during the course of the day. The, uh, and I said, well, the, what about the old system? The, uh, how long did you run that in parallel? Because the typical way that you would test a new system is you'd take the old system, and keep it running, plug the new system in, so that if the new system craps out, the, uh, it, you still got something that doesn't ruin your, your schedule for the day. I said, oh, we threw it out in about three days. And then I said, the, the, uh, so what are you going to do when we take you know, your beta system and send it up to Sacramento for the beta in Sacramento? And Leonard said, oh, you, you got to give me your uh, name and where you live, because I need to know where to come and slash your tires. And that's because I said, these guys have got something. The, uh, if the customer doesn't want to give it up to that extent, although he was joking, the, um, they have something which is the, uh, hopefully going to be sticky. The, uh, after you figured out the, you know, kind of how many users, how many people could potentially use this, you want to size up some things about the market characteristics. So this, this is the, the thing of it's a bad idea to go build a new operating system. You know, or it's a bad it's a bad idea to build a new search engine. Um, the uh, that is going to be a generalized one that competes directly with Google and Yahoo. So if the if the market characteristics are made up of the uh, big dominant entrenched players, it's harder than if you have the few market participants uh, or no smart, uh, the, the strong market participants. Same is true on the buyer side of the equation. So if I if I'm going to start a Gee whiz, new the automotive uh, the, the parts business. Uh, there are only three people in North America that I can sell to, and a series of foreign manufacturers. But my market is 25 people, and those people all collude to push hard on the suppliers. So it's a hard business. So market characteristics means the um, how quickly does the, does your particular market adopt new technology or new products? How many sellers are there? How many buyers are there? How price elastic is the, is the market? You can try to get a feeling for, can a startup company flourish in, with the, in the marketplace that I'm going to? The, uh, I mentioned competitive landscape. So the, uh, you know, the, this, is, this is the no-brainer. It's better to go into markets where there are no entrenched players, and it's better to go into markets where there aren't 50 or 100 other people who you're competing against. The, um, it's better to go into, in, into markets where the, uh, Sales and marketing costs are lower because you have the, the customers who are willing to experiment with uh, new companies, new products all the time. The, uh, and then you begin to look at, well, what are, the, what are the things that create success? So you look for analogs, closest neighbors. The, uh, if it were a company that the, is an internet company which depends on having a critical mass of users, the, one of the drivers are, how do I early on get a network going because a LinkedIn or a MySpace with 100 people, none of which you know, is not something that anybody else goes to. So you have to figure out a way that you can get to enough critical mass that people start referring out. And every industry is different. And you need to go figure out what those are, who are the people that you need to attract. The, uh, this next to last bullet point of who owns what I've invented is critical. So 
at Arxis, it's a little bit complicated. The, uh, the, the, my guys worked for a government lab. The government lab had absolute owner right, uh, ownership rights to it, subject to this water company who was a the contractor. They had a contract too. So the, uh, the, the, if you then think about what do you do, do next, I'm going to have that. Sorry about that. The, um, I'll come back to the next slide in a second. The, uh, you need to, the next stop after saying, I think I've got something. I think I've got something that addresses a big market. I think I've got something that's significant that could fit into that, the uh, addictive category. Now go and visit a good attorney. The, uh, and if you don't know one, then it, go to somebody here the, uh, who's already started a company before or works with the entrepreneurial community because there are you know, hundreds of them, literally, that work with startup companies. And you have to figure out who owns it. And once I know who owns it, is it protectable? Because generally speaking, the uh, technologies which can be protected are more likely to give you the higher margins because they're monopolies or quasi-monopolies. Uh, the, 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 and then the question is, the, uh, have you pro has whoever owns it properly protected it up to this point? So if you've disclosed technology or published about it, you've already lost some of your rights. The, uh, in the case of Arxis, the good news is, as they invented stuff, they took it to the Sandia in-house licensing department. And those guys were smart enough to go out and get it, patent, uh, get it patented. So there were a series of patents that Sandia owned. The, uh, the next stop was they checked to see, did this contractor have any rights to the technology? And they signed off saying, nope, we, we've got they, they were able to use what we developed, but for other applications, the, uh, you guys don't, don't have to worry. And this brings me to the map of the world of, here, here's what Arxis discovered. They said, well, we've invented something for detecting pathogens in the water supply, but where else does that have applicability? And this sample prep technology, the lazy engineer's dream, I've just figured out a way to make four hours of tedious work go away and have a machine do it for me in 10 minutes. That's actually pretty interesting. There's this diagnostics market out here, which is you go to the hospital and you get your blood drawn and they do all these tests with it. That's diagnostics. And, of that, and that's, that's $30 billion a year just in this country. And by the way, $3 billion of that absolutely critically depends on the type of technology that these guys at Arxis have invented. So now you can say, boy, there's $3 billion where I can save people time and money and the use of expensive equipment. That's pretty interesting. And Sandia has already protected it for me. The, uh, but look what else I can do. The, uh, the blood supply critically depends on screening. You, you need to, I think everyone's heard of the uh, screening for HIV in the blood supply, but they actually screen for hepatitis and a lot of other things. And those are big contracts um, run out of the uh, Red Cross and the US government and other places, so screening banks. The, uh, and boy, our technology applies there. And then there's this area of research. There are all these people at Lawrence Berkeley and at Lawrence Livermore and here at UC and at UCSF and Stanford and add on and on and on that are using affymetrics micro, microarrays or they're using Illumina arrays, or they're using the, the, um, the, the uh, GE Amersham arrays to do re research. So this is put all your genes on a chip and now run experiments to try to figure out what causes cancer. And that's a pretty big market. That's also in the billions of dollars. And they have to prep their sample, and that's also a pain in the butt. And there's a whole bunch of research which is not array-driven. It's microplate well-driven. And they, too, have samples they have to prepare. And then there are all these people who are working on screening molecules and running samples for drug discovery in the pharmaceutical industry and in the biotech industry. Think the Chirons and Amgens of the world. And they have to do sample prep, too. And so the, the, the scientist and the engineer, Jay and Kyle, they said, boy, we think we really have something. So after they visit the, they visit the lawyers and they say, we've got to license something from Sandia. The, and we need to form our own company so that any ongoing inventions or new inventions that we have 
we own them as opposed to the, them continuing to be the property of Sandia because the property of somebody else we Arxis have to pay for if we want to get access to it. So they formed, they formed a company and now they have to figure out, they, they have to get some money because they, 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 uh, uh, they need a way of paying for lab space and they need a way of paying for reagents and they need a way of paying themselves. And to get money, they have to figure out, well, what's the plan? So that the, the, this uh, point here of budget and milestone plan to first product, I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes talking about, and, and it's absolutely critical. This, the, the, uh, this is, in my mind, once you think you've got something, the most important thing that you can do is figuring out what resources it, does it take for me to get to a milestone which reduces risk, which makes me more valuable to somebody giving me more money. The, uh, the, and and that's, that's a step for attracting either early angel money, so early friends and fa family money, the, and it's also a step for getting somebody like me to get interested. The, uh, uh, so how do you do that? The, um, the, the company moved into Jay's garage and set up shop there. Um, they didn't have any money to pay themselves with while they did the planning process. The, uh, they first had to figure out what does it take to go from this prototype sample prep device to getting something on the market? How many people do I need with what skill sets? Which engineers, which marketing people, which product marketing people? The, uh, so they, the, the, the mistake they made here in the process is they called up their old college buddy from Davis that they used to row crew with and, and said, come on over and help us figure this out. Because he was the business guy. He was a, a commercial banker the, and a very nice uh, gentleman. The uh, problem was he didn't know diddly about this industry. The, uh, but together, the three of them put together a plan. They said, the, uh, we think we need the, uh, about the nine months to get first product on the market. And we think we need a team of about 10 with this set of skill sets. And we think it's going to cost us this much. And we need these pieces of equipment, which we'll buy on eBay. And we need to get some space, about this many, to fit 10, 11, 12 people in it. The, and here's how we'd add those people. Here's what we need to pay for uh, patent bills. And they baked that all into a timeline, milestones achieved, the, and, and money that they need to spend. And they began walking the corridors, knocking on doors for somebody to give them money. The, uh, and the, 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 the next thing that usually happens at this stage is you can convince somebody who is the, uh, uh, your friend, your relative, or someone who has done well as a business person to part with a little bit of money because they believe in you. So angel funding is all about, I believe in you and your vision and the, the people that, that, it, that you have. So I'm going to write you a personal check for $50,000 or $25,000 or $100,000 to get you to a place where you've got a demonstration point. And here, in, the, in their case, they wanted the, to have a couple hundred thousand dollars. The two to 300 was what they thought they needed to be able to have a more demonstra the, the viable demonstration. So coming back to pictures, to show something like this and something like this. The, if you click on this, the, uh, s the, the sample moves in and it snakes back and forth across this uh, microarray, which is spotted with the, the probes, which interrogate the sample to pluck out the, the uh, sequence of the, stick the, the uh, RNA in question sticks to the probe at a spot. The spot lights up, and you know that that type of RNA is in the sample. The, the, uh, so, th so they built those, and they had a timeline, and they went out and began to get some people that believed in them. And I want to point out the second biggest mistake that the uh, most entrepreneurs make is they grossly underestimate total project costs. So they said, we think we need two to $300,000 to the, uh, get somebody to give us a couple million dollars. And we think we need the uh, five or six million dollars over the life cycle of this company to launch three products. The, uh, so I have here at the very 
far end of this with the $15 million, I say, Series A plan. That's the average amount of capital that the typical entrepreneur coming into Claremont Creek Ventures thinks that they're going to need to take a business from where they are today through a place where they don't need any more external capital. And then if you, if you just run your finger across this, the, uh, at the, you, you can see that you have to look hard for IPOs, that can, that, that for IPOs with a company from zero to IPO consumed less than $30 million. There are some, but the, uh, the, on a, the, the averages basis, today it takes 50 or $60 million of capital to get a company big enough and successful enough that they'll be accepted by capital markets. The, uh, I don't have Vonage on here. Vonage on here would, would the blow the scale because that was four or five hundred million dollars of capital. The um, <laughs> what do you have, what do you have to give talent to attract talent? This is the other place where uh, people sometimes underestimate the, uh, uh, the, the 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 monkey picture up there is the uh, I'll, t I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, but the bottom picture down there is Howie, Howie Goldstein, and he's now the uh, CEO who is running Arxis. The um, to get a good CEO with experience the, at an early stage venture, you need to give him about six to eight percent of the company, and you are the uh, top technical person and you are kind of C level people. You need to give him between one and two percent of the company, and you got a bunch of VPs. They the all getting the um, a percent or so each, maybe one to one and a half percent, and then after you've taken care of the people who you're really going to count on to make the business happen, your CTO, your VP of engineer, your VP of sales, your VP of marketing, your COO, your CFO, your CTO, the, um, not of which all come on board the same day, the, uh, you've already burned up 12, 13, 14% of the company. And then you sprinkle around another 6 or 7% so that everybody in the company, they based on the experience level the, uh, in, in the company, has some options and some stake in the outcome. The, and in the early days, you'll probably give these options in lieu of salary to people who join on, join on early. The, uh, so, so when you brew that down to what's the total, the, uh, a fifth to a quarter of the venture goes out the door to incent people who aren't yet part of this to become a part of it. And uh, this is the, typical for what I see. The, uh, and if you prepare for that in advance, it's much easier to attract the, the talent you need. So how's that apply to Arxis? I've got a CTO, I've got a VP of engineering as founder, and I've got a president CEO. Except remember that president was a commercial banker the, um, who didn't know anything about life sciences. The, uh, and was a, a very nice guy, but the, they'd been struggling to get funded for two years when I stumbled across these guys. The, uh, and he couldn't understand why. And so uh, after spending some, uh, some time with him, the, uh, I, I said, Psst. part of the problem is that the financial community doesn't want John to learn how to be a life science CEO on their money. The, uh, so we, we need to solve that. The, uh, and I said, tell you what, why don't I the, uh, bring a friend, a guy who is the um, been a part of in terms of the uh, senior management team for companies that at my prior venture firm the, uh, were all big money makers. So that's Howie down here. The, uh, and Howie immediately understood the promise of what they had and also naivete in terms of the two founders of what's it take to commercialize a product. Commercializing a product means you know, you've got, the, you got a, reduce things down to a bill of materials and suppliers and a warranty and a contract and a spec and it goes on, and manufacturability goes on and on and on and on and on the uh, but with some time the two founders warmed to Howie Howie immediately warmed to the two founders and the opportunity and they were ready for Howie to step in if John would step out except the, their friend John happened to own a quarter of the company. And uh, the, the, uh, there was no way of getting his quarter back if he didn't agree. 
And he kind of liked being the president of the company too. So I was in a quandary because I couldn't invest in a company that didn't have the team that I thought could bring it forward. The, uh, and Howie wasn't going to join unless he was going to run things. And the, the uh, John wasn't going to leave the, uh, voluntarily. So what do you do? So we, we got people, people in a room, and we worked on it. And the, uh, we, we used a little bit of the carrots and a little bit of the stick. And at the end of the day, John agreed to give back most of his stock, because we needed that 25% for everybody else. Remember that chart? The, uh, and the, how we agreed to step in as the CEO, unpaid at the beginning, until we got, remember that I mentioned ownership? Two years had gone by, and they still hadn't completed their license with Sandia. So we had to go back and get the license right. And with Sandia, the, uh, they, they said, oh boy, we see an investor at the table. That means we can extract a big licensing fee. So back and forth, back and forth, we went with Sandia, who has to get approval from the Department of Energy, because that's who they're funded by, ultimately. The, uh, but after about six weeks, we got that right and had clear ownership to our intellectual property. And all of our filings were right. The, uh, we went through a process that's called a freedom to operate study. So what that means is, the OK, we have patents on our stuff. But if we go and build our product line the way we want to, how do I know I don't stumble across somebody else's patents? The, uh, uh, and, and, and that was probably about uh, $50,000 of legal work that had to be done. And we got it done for about half that, which, we, which made us happy. And that's why Howie is smiling. And how we got the proverbial 6 to 8% of the company. Um, and they put together a revised plan that says, how can we build the company over the next 18 months? The, uh, and I'm really happy to report that they've got the uh, product in the market right now in the, uh, the late phases of beta. It's, perfor it's performing well. There's going to be a uh, launch of this the, the second quarter, we think. They, we're getting a lot of interest from partners. The, um, the, the, this, this piece here of the, the two advice points are, there's kind of two things I'm looking for in this plan. What do you need to achieve critical milestones? And how do we plan to cover 18 months of runway so that the money that Claremont Creek and other investors give you the, the gives you enough time to achieve something that makes the company more valuable than when we put in our money? So the, uh, because a lot of these projects don't work, the, uh, we're looking for you to grow the, grow the value of the company 50 to 100% a year. So it's a high hurdle rate. And when you hear people complain about, boy, it's so hard getting capital for my project, what really the marketplace is saying is that the, uh, we don't think you can generate that type of hurdle rate for us. It may be a very good business. But for the averages to work out for where we fit into the capital food chain, that's where you need to be. The, the, um, so what are some of the key mi uh, the milestones which build value? The uh, uh, first thing is having clear intellectual property ownership rights. So we hope that the, those licenses that we executed with Sandia make, makes Arxis more valuable than when they didn't have the license. The, uh, and building a couple of good business people into the team, we think that helps too. So we've got a, a core team of 10, the, uh, most of which are on the science and engineering side, the three of which are on the uh, business, sales, marketing, um, biz dev side. The, uh, and we think it's the right mix, mix of skill sets for now. Then we have to go out and build something. We have to have a commercially ready, manufacturable product, which means we, we have suppliers that we have to deal with, the, uh, a contract manufacturer that we deal with, and then we do the final assembly ourselves. The, um, we also do uh, the QA, QC work when the product comes in. It, having some early customers really adds value. So nothing adds value to a venture more than having partners that can bring you lots of customers quickly and lots of customers who like the product and like the, s the solution and end up being good testimonials for you. The, uh, the, 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 um, and then this last point of a, a repeatable sales model, the, um, I'll tell you a story about how the, uh, 
we lost money once when I was at Alafi Capital. So I worked at a, uh, before going off and, and being an entrepreneur myself, I spent eight years inside uh, an all biotech, all health, health sciences venture firm the, uh, with, th that was enormously successful, the, um, thanks, to, thanks to my mentor, a, a man named Moshe Alafi. Uh, we had a project in St. Louis where back in 1991, 92, 93, we wanted to build a product called a portal imager. Technology came out of Washington University. The, uh, a portal imager was a way of having a view into where a, the, the uh, linear accelerator for radiation therapy, the beam was going. So if I'm doing radiation therapy on a big Siemens linear accelerator or a big Varian box or a big Philips box, the, I really want to hit the tumor. And I really want to miss the heart tissue next to it, or the lung tissue, or the brain tissue, depending on. The, uh, so we uh, built this. It was a plastic fiber optic device that was pulled. The, the uh, magic was in the fiber optics, the, hooked up to a CCD camera, a couple of them, uh, with then some really smart software. And we built a prototype, and we sold one. And we sold another. And we sold another. And we sold another. And we said, wow, we really got something here. So the, uh, we decided that we were going to the, crank it up and build out a sales force and do some other things. The, um, what we didn't read well in that one is that those were the only four portal imagers that were ever going to be sold in the world. <laughs> and, and the reason for that, that, the mistake that the management team made, and we missed too on this, is that the uh, Company, the, the, the organizations that bought these um, were places like the Max Planck Institute uh, or Cedar sinai Hospital or the Mayo Clinic. They were big research hospitals who were looking for new toys where we had the exact right budget price point that somebody who was looking to have a new toy to generate some new research results to write a new paper and get it published could use our portal imager and do a study with and without and get a paper published. And Mazel Tov, that was great for them, but nobody else in the world wanted it. The, neither the manufacturers to partner with us, uh, nor the end users to retrofit existing devices. So the, the, the company went down in dismal failure, and I had the, the great joy of having to fly to St. Louis one day um, to put the company into bankruptcy, to, to, to fire, to fire the, the CEO and everybody else. The, uh, and put the company into bankruptcy because not only didn't it work, but there was also a couple million dollars of unpaid bills that the board didn't know about until the night before I flew down. So uh, the, the understanding that your potential market is big and that you can demonstrate that you can not sell just a couple of prototypes, but you've got something that satisfies a, a large class of customers. Coming back to Arxis again, the uh, uh, ideally, we want to be able to have early customers in academic settings like uh, Sandia or a UC Davis or a UCSF, but we also want to have people who are using this, the, this technology for other com commercial applications. Remember I talked about the uh, a biotech, a big pharma, using it for d drug discovery, where I talked about researchers that are using it to run the uh, HTS. Uh, so, so high throughput screening applications on AFI chips or on uh, micro well plates. The, uh, it, the, we want to be able to demonstrate that we have something that speaks to either many segments or speaks to one segment with mo lots of different types of customers. So little biotech company, big biotech company, massive biotech pharmaceutical company like a Roche Genentech as an example. The, uh, the, if you've got that, then you have hit the milestone where somebody's willing to put a lot more money into saying, now it's just a question of money and management uh, and execution as opposed to technical risk, market risk, product risk, and a whole bunch of other things. The uh, result, when we do that work right and you do that work right, the company is more valuable. The um, last thought that I wanted to leave people with is the uh, as you're getting to that place of figuring out how long do I need and how much money does it take, the uh, entrepreneurs often underestimate the how long does it take for me to get 
millions of dollars. The, uh, now, there are examples in hot markets. The energy and clean tech is hot right now. Uh, Web 2.0 is hot right now. Social networking is hot right, right now. That where someone can get funded really quickly, the meaning in a month or two. Uh, but on average, what happens is it takes you a month just to get meetings set up with somebody like one of my partners or me, because we're busy. The, the, our job is to meet with lots of people. The, uh, and that means just getting on our schedule is, is not easy. And once you've had that initial meeting, then it usually takes my process a couple of months, the uh, two or three, to get to a place where we say, this is something that meets all of our criteria. So we've, we've gone back and gone through some of these steps, too. It, it, the, is the market really there? What's the competitive landscape look like? The, the, uh, how much capital is this thing really going to take? How capital intensive is it? The, uh, what are the subtle characteristics of the marketplace in terms of uh, buyers, sellers, channels, and so on? The, uh, so two, three months have gone by, and now we want to negotiate a deal with you. And that takes, sometimes we're lucky, and we say, here's a fair proposal. And the entrepreneur says, cool, I'm in. But most of the time, their lawyer says, you can do better here or better there. The, uh, and if there are many interested parties, or even one more, you often can in the, improve the terms of the offer you get uh, the, the, um, and drive an drive a even better bargain for yourself. So that process chews up another two to four weeks. And now we the, uh, finish all of our legal due diligence, and the final documents get, get drafted. And another four to six weeks go by, and voila, you're funded half a year later. So the, uh, and that process was consistent for uh, the, where we were with Arxis. It took us from beginning to end about half a year to solve the, the leadership issues that we had, to, to solve the license issue that we had, to help find facilities, and then get through all of these steps. The, uh, and with that, I'll take your questions. Sure. gets funding like this, how do the owners end up in terms of the equity structure? Great question. So uh, in a company like this, what's the uh, typical ownership posi the position for the founders? The, um, the first answer to this is, what type of ownership do you have? So investors usually ask and get preferred stock. The, and the founders usually have common stock. If things go well, the, uh, the preferred stock converts to common stock on the day of an IPO. And the, uh, your stock is the same as the investors. But in all other scenarios, other than, it, the, than an IPO that, that I've seen, the common stock has certain preferences, which, which makes it a little bit more valuable than your common stock. The, uh, the biggest preference is going to be the uh, at a liquidation or sale or merger of the company. Do I need to do something? <coughs> it, it is just, it, it is just at the, uh, the sale, merger, liquidation of the company, the preferred stock gets paid back first. So I get my money back. And then we split up by our percentages. And the question you ask is, how much percentage does the founder get? It's negotiated. It depends on the, uh, how much money goes into the company. So the, uh, if you receive $2 million, million, the split will be different. Might be, say, 25% to the investors and 75% 70, to the founders and the uh, management team. The, if you get $5 million, it might be the uh, 50% to the investors and 50% to the founders and management team. And then as the next round of financing comes on that, that dilutes everybody. So if you walk it through what happens from beginning to a successful venture, the, uh, the founders usually end up with 
somewhere between 5 and 15 percent after all the money's gone through when it, when it works out well. But remember, you're now talking about 5 to 15 percent of something that's worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. So the, uh, the, the right way to think of it is that what's the value of my interest? My interest is two things, the number of shares I have and the price per share. And so if you have a million shares that starts off having 100 percent of the company and they're all worth a penny, you don't have very much. But if you have a million shares and everybody else has got 9 million shares, but now your shares are worth 10 bucks, you've got something. And that the, that's, that's the arithmetic. How many shares, what percentage, and how va valuable are the shares worth? Next question. Yes, sir. Um, how important is it to find the CEO before approaching the VCs, or should <coughs> entrepreneurs look to a VC to help them find a, uh, a CEO, like in the case of this sample company? They didn't, or they found a bad CEO. Should we, is it better to approach a VC and say, look, we're inexperienced engineers. We have a product, but we need someone to head up the company. Can you help us? And this is our plan. We should they try and look for someone first and then approach the business? So the, um, I, I think there's, it depends on the situation. The, um, what? Repeat the question. Oh, OK. So question, the, uh, the, for our early stage company, the, uh, which is engineering driven, Better to find a CEO and go to VCs with CEO in tow? Or is it better to go to VCs and say, hey, we know we need to bring in a good CEO. One of the things we're looking for, for, for you to help us with is to help us find that right person. So both approach, approaches work. The, uh, if you find somebody who's really good, who's excited about the project, and has got a good CV, the, uh, you come in and say, this is the person to, to run it. This is the, per, who, the, uh, the, the, we think this is the right person. And of course, we understand that everyone on the team the, uh, needs to pull their weight. The, uh, and if you have better candidates to be our bosses at some point, anybody, including the guy here who we think would make the great CEO, the, um, we welcome your the help and support in doing that. The, uh, you've made the job a little bit easier for an investor if you found the great CEO to come with you, because he doesn't, he doesn't have the risk of have, how long is it going to take to find that person, and how's that person going to want to change the strategy and business plan when, when he or she comes in. The question over here someplace. Next question. There's one. What are the chances of like an experienced young person, I guess someone like ourselves, being that CEO? Because it feels kind of nice to like that CEO. <laughs> Hey, part of being an entrepreneur is that you get to be boss, and you get to have a big ego if you want. The, um, and history is replete with people with a technical background who have ended up becoming terrific CEOs. Bill Gates did pretty well, um, as an example. The, uh, the, I think that you want to be a little bit humble in your the approach with investors, so that the, if investors are showering you with you know, choices, the, uh, the, then you can say, hey, I'm running this thing until I'm out of my depth or out of my league. And then I would expect the board collectively to come to the decision that we need to bring in somebody the, uh, to be my boss or bring in somebody and have me move to the sidelines. The, uh, and I think that answer resonates well with investors. The, um, if you really feel right from the beginning that you're not up to the challenge, then I think it's better to say, hey, I know I'm young. This is the one I'm going to learn on. I want to roll in this. I want to make it important. I'm running it now because I can't afford to hire the, the person who I think could drive it to the next level. With your money, we can find that right person together at the appropriate time. Next question. Follow up, yes, sir. Just as a follow up, um, what kind of skills can we develop right now so that uh, we could you know, not be overwhelmed with this uh, CEO or something like that? Because the way that I guess I understood it um, from your lecture is that the standard template is that you, someone comes with technical knowledge and hire someone with the CEO with skills and experience and wondering what kind of skills we can bring so that we uh, 
might be someone capable of working. Yeah, I think the answer to that is that uh, the, the experience is the very best the uh, set of skills that you can get to get into a small entrepreneurial environment. So the, uh, the, to, to the extent of summer jobs, internships, go work at the uh, part-time job, go work at an organization which has ambitions to grow fast. So grow fast means I want to grow 50 to, to 100 percent uh, every year or every half year or every quarter. The, uh, the, the, and if that environment is small and you can rub shoulders with the person who has to worry about customer service or worry about quality or worry if it's a manufacturing shop, worry about manufacturability uh, or worry about user interface or worry about member acquisition or worry about business development. The, uh, so there are all these things that fall into an organization the, uh, like selling um, or like marketing, the, which are best learned, I think, the uh, being in a small company and, and the, being in hand-to-hand -hand combat, especially if the company is executing and you're learning at the, 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 the shoulder to shoulder uh, with someone who has made, made a few mistakes, had a few successes at a couple of other companies that they've been at previously. Yes, sir. How long is a venture capital firm involved in the company in the long term? Like at what point do they say, OK, our work is done, and we move on to the Great question. So the, uh, how long is a venture firm involved was the question. The, the, uh, the, the answer at my stage, so if I'm coming in as the first preferred stock investor, the averages are that my relationship with you will be longer than the average marriage in America. So it's a long time. <laughs> the, uh, so, so typically a, a uh, five to seven year cycle. The, um, my requirements are I'm looking to build a portfolio of 20 to 25 companies over a three, four, five year period. And I'm lo looking to harvest all of, that, uh, all of that. So plant in three or four years, harvest within 10 or 12 at the outside. So I'm looking for a cycle that the, uh, hopefully either the company gets bought or the company goes public in seven years or less. The, uh, it, the, if it takes 10, that's OK. It can't take 15. That's not acceptable for the, where I am. Question. I've heard that venture capital firms uh, stand by not signing NDAs given to them from entrepreneurs just because they don't like creating liabilities for themselves. Is that the industry standard? Yeah, so the question was, the uh, VCs won't sign, uh, sign NDAs uh, under 10. Boy, I hate that. Uh, it's true. VCs do not sign NDAs or rarely sign NDAs. The, if you came to me and said, I want to talk to you, the, you got to sign my NDA, I'd say, tell me what you can tell me without an NDA, um, because we just don't do that. Uh, the, 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 um, so, and then I'll caveat it. The, uh, the, the, if we, the, the, so most things that get me interested enough to spend time in you, I, they, I don't want to give to anybody else because my keeping your information private is part of the way I build my reputation. And most people with a good reputation the, uh, are absolutely stellar about that. So I think you can trust people. Um, they, they check them out first. Uh, but then I think you can trust them. The second, the, the, um, if I've gotten really interested and there's some special information, so I'm looking at a project right now that uh, comes out of the, the, um, the uh, protein, th protein synthesis and building artificial genes to look at that. And this company, uh, which comes out of Irvine, has got a secret sauce around that, and they have CDAs or confidentiality agreements with a bunch of their clients. And their clients are people like Wyeth and Merck and Amgen. And I'd kind of like to see some of that data. The, uh, because the, uh, so it's possible that um, after I've gotten, remember that diligence stage and then there's the term sheet stage? If I were in a term sheet with these guys and I'm finishing off my investment, then I might sign a CDA 
to see that data to make sure that it fit with my investment thesis. Because if it didn't, I might want to back away. So it might be worth it. But it's, it's going to be a rare case after a long examination of a lot of other things. The, uh, and, and usually people who want you to sign confidentiality agreements haven't done anything yet. They've got an idea. They're worried about somebody stealing their idea. Don't worry if you're dealing with somebody trustworthy. Uh, there were some questions back over here. I'll come to you in a second. Yes, sir. My question is about the control over what I introduce. And from what I understood so far, like uh, after a while, I will be a small percentage, and uh, the uh, decision making might not necessarily be in my hands. I'm concerned about the ethical issues that, and how my idea is going to be used. Uh, so, what do you suggest in those uh, situations? How to? I mean, I'm, uh, going about uh, starting with the internet and uh, promoting this idea. Okay. The so the question the question is the uh, I want to tell you about uh, my idea for a company. The um, I'm concerned that you, the venture capitalist, might not be ethical in how you use that information. So you may use it for another portfolio company, for a competitor, for another startup. The how do I control the uh, that information and hopefully try to prevent you from doing something that would hurt me. And it's a good concern. So the uh, thought one, try to deal with people that you hear recommend, you keep hearing good things about them. You know, so it, the, uh, you, you, you walk around the CET and you walk around Haas and you, see, you hear, boy, that John Stewart, he's a good guy. The, he, he helped me out. The, uh, the, he treated me right. You hear people saying that where you, you ask around about them, or that Mario Rosati at Wilson Sonsini, the uh, he's a good guy. He went to Cal too. It, the, uh, it, you can trust him. The, uh, go to people like that first. That's your best defense. Uh, story, when the, um, my partner Nat Goldhaber and I did CyberGold, uh, and we were out in this process ourselves, the, uh, uh, we went to well, a lot of VCs when we did our Series C round. The, uh, and got a lot of rejection. It felt really lousy. Um, and one of the people that we went to see was at a very good firm, but it was kind of a new guy at that firm. And you know what? Three weeks later, our business plan landed, at, landed on the desk of one of our competitors. And we found out about it. And uh, you know, what, what are we going to do? Go sue him? Um, but it, it felt yucky. The, uh, there, the, 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 uh, the mistake on our part, I think, was that we didn't make sure that we got to somebody who had a reputation at that firm that he didn't want to lose, the, uh, and instead landed on the desk of a newbie who we couldn't figure out the reputation. The uh, thought two, you control the information flow. So the, uh, it, the, it, the, you're trying to get to me or one of my colleagues to say that your idea is good and can be big, and you're looking for interest and advice and to get a second meeting, to get interest. The, um, and my job is to look at lots of ideas and to throw out 95% of them and spend time on the best one out of 20 or one out of 100 the, uh, and try to figure it out and be helpful. And I hope that on the 95% that I say no to after a short period of time, like the length of this lecture, the, uh, I hope I can point in some directions that are helpful to every project. Because if you're good to entrepreneurs, it, it comes back to you. The, um, the, the, so controlling the information is when I come, the stuff that I write on paper, I can, it's better, I can, there are more things that I can tell you because it's hard for me, harder for me to write something down and use it in a way that's inappropriate than it is if you send me an electronic copy of something that's easy for me to email around. Now you're gonna, I'm going to ask you to send me at least some sort of a executive summary of what you're doing before you come in so that I don't feel like an idiot at our first interaction. The, uh, but you control what goes into that. You control what goes into your PowerPoint. You control what goes into your business plan. And you can hold out pieces that you think are so proprietary and so important and only talk about those verbally. That is one technique. The, um, did that answer your question? I 
away uh, for some time and then he went back. So he, um, to see all of the uh, people and investors not necessarily agreeing to share the same idea with the founders, uh, is there any way for the founder to maintain um, what the, the control that he had on where uh, the business is? Can the founder ma maintain control is a question. We're running past time, so you might want to take you know, one last question. And if it's a long answer to the other one, you guys can actually, you can address questions after class two. Okay. The, uh, I, I'll give you a short, a short answer. The, the, can, can it main, can maintain control? No. The, uh, the, 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 not if you want to take in significant amounts of venture capital. The, it just comes with the territory. but. Hey, the, uh, nobody fired, fired Bill Gates and nobody fired uh, Larry and Sergey over at Google. Let me take you in the front, madam, as the last question. That's okay, I can ask you a few comments. Who's got a last question for me? Back there. So, for those who want control, is the SBIR a better option? It depends on the type of, type of business. So, the, uh, you give a different type of control in an SBIR, the, uh, the government has the rights to your technology under an SBIR, I think it's a great program. I think NIH funding is also a great uh, program, but it's hard to get money under those programs to build out manufacturing, sales and marketing, and other big cost centers. So the, uh, if you have a smaller-ish consulting business, the, that's a great answer. And some people bootstrap the whole way. The, um, the, 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 I'd argue that you get more by having more resources and more smart people to help you uh, than you give up. But that's a choice that every entrepreneur has to make. The, uh, so I guess that's it, Eclock, huh? Thank you, everybody.